Up next, we've got uh, Spencer Ellis from the Colorado Department of Higher Education on a panel with Alex Kaplan from IBM Blockchain, Shannon Liu from Jobs for the Future, and Michael Torrance from Motlau State. That's Colorado. Hey, welcome. Thank you all so much. Thanks for kicking it over. Um, thanks for joining our pan panel today on learning and employment data, self-sovereign infrastructure. As mentioned, my name is Spencer Ellis, and I'm the Director of Educational Innovation at the Colorado Department of Edu Education. I'll be your moderator for this session. Um, I wanted to start with a big thank you to the East Denver team for an amazing event so far. So much going on. Um, I see our panelists filtering in here. Thank you, Jonathan, for getting this queued up. Uh, so much going on, so many activities, so much to do. I could have filled my entire weekend with the uh, the events of the of just East Denver, so thank you all so much. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, and I'm learning a lot. That's that's to say I'm learning a lot too. So thanks again for, for the fantastic event. I also got my conference swag that I wanted to show off. You can kind of see there, which is great. If you haven't gotten yours, um, you know, you're eligible to, to use your voucher. Oh, it looks like Michael. Michael got his, which is great. So uh, uh, put your order in if you haven't, uh, just a little plug for that, but I love it. Thank you all so much for your hospitality. This has been a great event. Um, so just a little bit more about the Department of Higher Education, which is one of the state agencies uh, that Russell and Lou were speaking about um, here in the state of Colorado. We are a state agency led by our executive director, Dr. Angie Piccioni, under the bold vision of Governor Polis who I think is joining for an Overwatch match later or something like that. Uh, League of Legends, League of Legends is what it is. And uh, so we at the, at the CDHE um, and in the state of Colorado work with our educational institutions as we strive to achieve the state education and economic work uh, and workforce goals. Uh, we do this by investing in innovation and leveraging technology for better experiences for learners and for systems for our institutions and in particular, serving those who need it the most. Obviously, the pandemic has disrupted higher ed for those who are who are engaged in any sort of courses or uh, maybe taking classes online currently. You know this firsthand. And it's forced us to think about how we better serve those who need it the most. So this has been a conversation not only with the Department of Higher Ed, but throughout the state of Colorado. Uh, what we're hoping to do is harness the disruption that higher ed has experienced and help it evolve into the next generation of higher education and workforce preparation. So today we pulled together this panel of experts to help us discuss opportunities and challenges in higher ed and what role data plays in this innovation conversation. So let's get, let's get going with our fantastic panel. Uh, we'll have each panelist introduce themselves and I will call on you all. So make sure to unmute yourselves. Um, we'd like you all to start with your name, a little bit more about your job and or organization. And finally, and probably most importantly, in the spirit of ETH Denver Innovation Festival, your favorite fantasy creature that is not a spork marmot. So we know the conference mascot is a spork marmot. What is your favorite fantasy creature uh, that is not a spork marmot? So we're going to start with my colleague at the Colorado Department of Higher Education, Michael Vonte. Michael. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here with you all. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Michael Vonte. I'm the Senior Director of Research and Data Governance at the Colorado Department of Higher Education. Probably more and more leaning into that second half of my title as the days go by, being able to think about how we leverage the data that we have to answer a whole host of questions and improve our practice and improve policy down the way. Um, in terms of, of animal, you know, for some reason, uh, Falcor from Neverending Story is just really in my brain today. So I'm going to go with that. Killer choice. And my dog looks a lot like uh, that particular creature. So I have a deep appreciation. Thank you, Michael. Um, next, we're going to kick it over to Sharon. Sharon, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, my name is Sharon Liu, and I'm an entrepreneur in residence at um, JFF Labs. Um, it uh, works together with a not national not-for-profit organization, J JFF, Jobs for the Future, which focuses on um, tech accelerating technology and other um, new models that will make our education and workforce systems more efficient so that um, we can provide opportunities for all. Um, and I'm really not like creative or imaginative in that way, but I wanted to, I got special permission from Spencer to actually, um, I guess, give a rebuttal on the spork. So I do a lot of backpacking and I find the spork to be one of the most ineffective tools for eating. And so this is actually my favorite 
um, eating thing for, um, and you can see that it's actually long so that you can eat out of like the freezer bags. And like the problem with sporks is that you can accidentally pierce the bag. Um, and so this one is actually got a silicone lip um, which makes it easier to scrape from the bottom of titanium and also bags. But this one's gotten eaten by a, a, a crow when I got attacked on a trip that I was on. But anyhow, my favorite eating utensil. Sharon, thanks for turning that question on its head. We appreciate it. And uh, hopefully John and the ETH team are listening so that they have a uh, future fodder for next year's conference mascot. Um, great. We are going to pivot over to Michael Torrance, President Michael Torrance. So Michael, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. Michael Torrance, President of Motlow State Community College uh, in Lynchburg, Tennessee. Um, what do I do every day? Uh, everything um, from picking up a piece of trash to making sure that we connect with state agencies and businesses and industry for the purposes of how does the vertical integration of technology improve the human condition? That's what I'm really focused on, which includes gaming, AI, and all those good things that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Uh, I did the little test where I could find out what my spirit animal would be. I thought that I was going to be a unicorn, but I am not. I am a hummingbird. Uh, so it, it's fitting after I read the descriptors of the hummingbird. So I'm, I'm a hummingbird. That's, that's pretty cool. Thank you, President Torrance, and so many cool things going on in Tennessee. I know uh, your your board of higher ed is very progressive and very uh, innovative in their policies and their practices, and uh, we've collaborated with them on a couple of projects in the past, too. Um, so thank you, and welcome to the Hummingbird. Uh, finally, we have Rick from IBM. Rick, are you with us on audio? Yes, I am. I'm a little, having a little trouble with the video there. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Uh, this is Rick Goldgar. I'm the Global Solutions Executive with IBM. <clears throat> I've been working on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, learning credential network and blockchain work for the last several years. Uh, I was also formerly CIO, CTO for Texas Education Agency, and a lot of technology background as well. Um, spirit animals, I don't know, but I, I kind of been interested in octopuses or octopi lately. They seem to have uh, distributed intelligence in their tentacles. <laughs> Well, well put. Uh, yes, distributed and one of the most clever animals that I've seen. I've seen them do some wild things. So thank you so much, Rick. We're so glad to have you here. Um, great. So now you all know a little bit more about our, our panel and kind of the great experiences they're bringing here. And so I'm going to throw out our first question for this panel. And um, whoever would like to go first is welcome to go first. Our first question, give you a little bit of a setup. So the state of Colorado and other states, of course, we talk about Texas, Tennessee. Um, collect a lot of data sets, collect a lot of different information um, in, in tandem with institutions uh, of higher education or other state agencies. So the question is, what are some of the challenges and opportunity around data governance and interoperability with regard to your clients, your constituents, your stakeholders in education, workforce, or democracy? You know, I'll take a, a first stab at this, but also very, very interested to hear from from all of our, our colleagues. Um, you know, as, as Spencer ha has mentioned, and, and uh, as Governor Polis uh, maybe said earlier today, you know, we're doing a lot of exciting things here in Colorado, a lot of um, great organic energy around um, well-governed, responsible data sharing and what that can mean and, and what we can harness by, by being able to do that. And so in terms of the, the challenges that we face um, and and what that means going forward. I think being able to navigate that, um, making sure that we have the trust of individuals as we're doing that, that important work. Um, as we talk about self-sovereign identity and all of the other uh, exciting aspects of this space, it's important that uh, we, again, as the state, move forward in that well-governed, responsible way and making sure that we never lose the trust of individuals as we're doing these, these things together and, and hopefully um, really telling an exciting story about a, a person's experience and, and hopefully what we can do as the state to, to make people's lives better. Michael, yeah, that was mentioned in the previous session just a, a moment ago about the, in particular, self-sovereign identity and identification at the state level. Well, I'll take a stab at following uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Michael Squared, right? That's us. Well, um, the, the idea of policy uh, as a, a representative of those of us within any state 
um, to provide governance that's based on trust is really important. So, you know, thinking through how our clients look at data share and as an institution, preparing those who come through us to have the requisite skills that are needed and prepared for those skills that are going to be expected uh, once we put them out into the job uh, placement areas uh, throughout the state or throughout the country, et cetera. Uh, for us, it's really, really important to think through um, not what we are teaching or creating in terms of skill based learning uh, as it's uh, tied to Web 3.0. But what's the expectation once they get out there? Uh, one of the things that's important for us to recognize right now is the world did not stop because of COVID. Um, business and industry, their expectations are not going to decline because of COVID. They are actually going to accelerate because of the, the way their business is going to be post uh, this, this, this mess that we're in. Thank you, President Torrance. I, I think, um, you know, th this has been going, if you've been following the Discord at all, especially in the, the state of Colorado channel, people have been talking about skills in particular. And I know that this is a trend in higher education, um, hopefully a trend that's here to stay, but the conversation has evolved right away to skills. So I'm glad that you raised that point. So I'm just going to add something um, to what uh, Michael and Michael have said. And I think it's really interesting because we always say we want the learning records and the employment records to be interoperable and that we should follow these data models. And, you know, this will achieve greater efficiency across the system and serve individuals better. And I think that largely that's um, a well-founded hypothesis. But one of the things that um, as we work with um, workforce systems across the country and institutions across the country that we that is something that I think technology developers should keep in mind is that the capability of individual like one-stop career centers or individual um, community colleges or small training providers or even small and medium-sized enterprises um, vary greatly. And um, some of the things that we are building are very complicated and difficult and expensive to implement. And to the extent that we can make sure that um, whatever platform or application or data model we're proposing is actually easily accessible and easily implementable and provide appropriate professional development for that. I think that we can um, we can work towards a greater adoption, but more than that, we can um, get adoption in places where um, there have there are greater concentrations of those kinds of individuals that we would like to serve. So, so thinking about populations um, that have like low technology or internet access or low income or traditionally underserved populations. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, I, know, I noticed um, in our state, a number of institutions have, uh, particularly higher education institutions, have thought about this concept around uh, um, virtual student services. And I think, you know, the ease of use, like you said, kind of uh, brings us to greater adoption for these services that could be at the, the fingertips, or so we think they're this, the fingertips of all of our Colorado residents. How do we make it eas easily accessible um, in that nature? Um, and let's see here, do we still have you with us, Rick? Would you like to weigh in on question number one? Go ahead, Rick, if you can. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you, yes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's been some great comments there. I'd like to add a few things just from my experience and, and, and also where I think things are going. Uh, so when I was at Texas Education Agency, uh, Texas, as you mentioned, one of the states has been very involved with gathering data for many, many years, probably started the original system for student level K-12 data about 35 years ago or more now. Uh, I went through a process that we did to create something called the Texas Student Data System to update, automate, and integrate that across the state for all the districts. And that was something that the state did internally but there was still the issue there that prior to that, the data went to the state and then didn't go back to the, to the education entities. After that, now the data goes to the state and back to the education entities, but there's still a question of whether the data goes to other people as well. So I think that there's a, a big need to make sure that the data is available uh, with permissions, of course, to the people who need it. And I also think that over the history, what's happened very recently, uh, you mentioned uh, skills, capabilities. I think that some new standards for learning credentials, like uh, the, the CLR standard from IMS, uh, open badges, and uh, more recently, the open skills work that's going on uh, to try to standardize the way skills are represented and how they're mapped 
to learning credentials is very critical for that sharing. Spencer, can I jump back in right quick? Please do. Uh, I, I couldn't help but think about the commercial. What's in your wallet? And, and so the idea of putting the credentialing or the skills that are akin and keen on being connected to what the workforce expects from us, but even more, more so, uh, what is it that's going to be necessary for us as human beings to be successful, not just in the workspace, but just operating within our communities? So the, the idea of, you know, literally what's in your wallet, uh, how, how can you function and, and operate successfully uh, in the spaces that are being created today? Thanks, President Torrance. And yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned that too, because it gives me an opportunity for a quick plug for a couple of our bounties that are available through the state of Colorado channel. And so for those of you who are kind of looking for um, uh, opportunities to, what I've been saying is hack higher ed. Um, it would be great if you could take a look at the, the Discord channel. Um, and one of the one of the bounties actually out there is, is around a, a credentialing wallet, um, this, this concept of a wallet. So um, the other is around something that Sharon mentioned, which is this learning employment record. And how do we do a better job of telling the story of a learner on a lifelong kind of trajectory? Uh, we know that learning experiences happen all the time. They happen in the classroom, co-curricular experiences. They happen at this conference. People are learning a lot of stuff. So how do we how do we sort of do a better job of telling the story of learners and the skills that they're building? So thank you for bringing that up. Um, all right, we're on to our second question. And our second question is, given this audience of global innovators, we have people from, I don't remember how many dozens of countries, but all over the world, uh, I think something like 6,000 participants, correct me if I'm wrong, one of you uh, ETH conference uh, <laughs> coordinators. Um, but given this vast audience, what radical challenges need to be solved at the intersection of Web3 innovation, statehood, higher education, self-sovereign infrastructure, skills, kind of all these concepts that we've been discussing. What are the radical challenges that you see out there for, for folks? I'm not gonna call on anybody. So you're gonna have to either give me the, the winky eye or uh, just go ahead and speak up. Well, I'll, 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 I'll uh do a first go around and, and please others. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, the radical things that we still need to tackle um, in thinking about the education space, the post-secondary space, higher ed space more broadly is, um, and, and Michael mentioned it, the, these skills and, and the, the um, being able to quantify these skills, being able to have these skills available to an individual and having giving the that individual the ability to express those skills in a digital wallet in these other ways and being able to do that translation of kind of a traditional post-secondary education space to the skill space and being able to work with our workforce partners and people in industry and being able to see the value of these skills. So I know these is, you know, conversations that all of us are in uh, day in and day out and trying to crack this nut and being able to tell that story better. And so uh, any help that anyone has on those fronts, I think is always welcome and, and being able to, to again, tell that whole student experience and help them be well positioned for their futures. Um, okay, so I'm going to add to that um, by also plugging some resources that I didn't create. So I think this is fair. Um, I think that people who are interested in the education and workforce connection, um, there are, should should consult a couple of really great resources. So one of the resources is um, a paper that was recent, a white paper that was recently released. It's on um, the T3 Innovation Hub's LER, I guess, resource hub, and it's one specifically dealing with self sovereign identity. Um, and then an earlier paper that was um, written by the um, Digital Credentials Consortium that's sort of led by MIT that talks about digital credentials generally. And then I think there's a section in there that talks specifically about some, um, identify some of the technical issues that need to be resolved. Um, and I'll just point out across both papers, I think a couple of the key questions are related to, um, I guess, the issues of privacy by design um, and, and like how individual data stores are managed given a sort of 
plethora of like privacy regulations, but also um, I think a philosophy where we do actually want to um, promote individual privacy and give individuals agency. Um, and then the issue of like sort of reliable decentralized identifiers. So if people could solve those technically, that would be super. Um, but I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll add to my answer by saying, in addition to the technical issues, I think there are some design questions that we want to be asking ourselves. I think a lot of why we claim that learning and employment records and digital wallets are important is because um, to what um, Michael said about the wallet, we want people to ha have and hold their credentials and be able to um, exchange them for additional opportunities. Um, but I would challenge you, if you are a developer thinking about building an application or some kind of platform for this, to really, really try to understand um, like what does it mean to provide economic opportunity um, for everyone. Um, not just um, people who have devices or connections, but even thinking about digital literacy or some of the, I guess, systematic barriers that we have um, in our systems that are not related to technology. And to really confront equity by design, um, to think about like, how can you then um, take this tool um, that we're creating and use that to advance yourself? Um, and, um, you know, a couple of key questions I might ask is, you know, is what I'm building functional outside of a context where um, social capital exists, right? Um, and how, how does a person um, get this and then get the next thing after and the next thing after? Um, I don't know if I can answer those questions, but um, I, I think those are really important in the context of this conversation. I'll, uh, this is Rick. Can you all hear me? I'll, I'll add to the... Uh... Sharon, good old Sharon. Um, the, the, one of the critical things I think needs to be sorted out, and I think some of this is policy uh, and some of this is technology, uh, is the value of credentials. Uh, I think we're seeing a sea change in how credentials are valued these days. Uh, you know, some years ago, if you had a degree from a university, that was a great thing. Today, if you have a, uh, a, a certificate from a programming school, you're probably earning as much as the people who have those degrees and you don't need a degree. So that movement in the value and how to characterize credentials and how to manage that value, I think is a, is a pretty thorny problem, but also really, really moving fast right now. Well, obviously I'm gonna simply concur with what my colleagues have said. Um, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, especially the conversations having with people in the communities uh, as we look at uh, equitable, um, transferable, um, usable uh, credentials and, and skill sets, uh, how that impacts regional economic and community development. And when, when I walked around and I looked through people's credentials that work within our service area and within our state, it's amazing that that's really not a uh, pathway that people have taken who may ho have those jobs, those positions. So understanding what that means and the impact that it has uh, for a skill to be affixed to who you're recruiting to come into your state, who you're recruiting to come into your community, whether it be at the um, city, a uh, micro metro, or just a broad countywide uh, area. And then, so, so that's one challenge. The second one I would say is uh, let's light up the dark fiber. Uh, you know, I don't know if we all are fiber hunters or if there are devs out there who like actually couldn't can fiber hunt. But when you drive in your vehicle, if you ride your bicycle, if you're taking a walk through your community and you know that there are nodes or linkages or dark fiber someplace and it's not lit up. And these typically impact uh, more impoverished areas or areas where I guess we just don't think that it needs to be lit up. Uh, but it's just a matter of literally opening up the box, plugging in a couple of uh, wires and, and lighting it up so that people can have access as Sharon is uh, denoted and, and Michael has denoted as well. Um, I think that's a really important caveat uh, as we go forward. You can't have access if we simply don't turn it on. Thanks for that, President Torrance and, and Rick, before that too. <clears throat> you know, you all raised a, a few points that really caught my attention and Sharon, one of them that you raised was this, this notion of digital literacy, which I think President Torrance, you were just kind of alluding to that even to have the opportunity to gain digital literacy, there are some infrastructural changes that have to be to be made. And Rick, um, you really kind of put that nicely when you mentioned this duality of like the technical and the policy challenges um, that are that are out there for folks either in education or in state government. And so 
I'm just wondering, um, you know, as we we come, we're coming to about five minutes, maybe um, some some closing thoughts from all of you. But um, you know, additional calls to action for state government or higher education. Um, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about some of the some of the uh, challenges and opportunities that the innovators at this conference could tackle. Um, what are some of those other broader objectives, maybe policy based or infrastructure based, that you all started to to pull the thread on? It's 3D, and Michael, I won't let us have a long pause in silence this time around, right? Um, it's it's 3D, and, and it's it's within it's embedded in the questions that have been asked today. Uh, we are looking for designers, dreamers, and doers. Um, if you reference Star Wars and, and Yoda, uh, you d either do or do not. There is no try. So the conversation that we're having today goes beyond simply just talking about and creating this exciting and, and, and most potent dialogue. It is about now that you now, now that we know, let's do something with the information. See something, do something. Uh, this is Rick. I'll I'll sort of follow on to that and say that you know uh, since I would spent a fair amount of time in government and a fair amount of time outside of government, that uh, uh, there are challenges on both sides. Uh, on the government side, uh, there historically, although I think it's changing in places like Colorado is a good example. There is historically a certain inertia, uh, 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 and that has to do with just how how rules and laws are passed and how they're conservative about keeping uh, things to make sure that things don't get corrupted. But that that has to change uh, to deal with how fast society is changing today. And then on the business side, I think that uh, there's a uh, obviously a strong capitalist and commercial motive uh, behind a lot of folks who are doing a lot of work. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the value to the citizens is very high here. And uh, I think that, that a lot of times put people get, uh, at least in companies, they overfocus on the bottom line and not so much on the, the public value. And I think if you focus a lot on the public value as a business, you'll find out it helps your bottom line. I'll just add quickly, um, the whole purpose of the interoperability of records um, and connecting data um, should actually not be lost that we are actually connecting people that work that, you know, work on the data side on the, in the education system, the workforce system, in the public sector and the private sector. And so as you solve these problems, I think it's really important to work on them together. Um, so um, to Michael's point, like do something, but do it with other people who are also interested in doing it, because I think that broadens your perspective and allows you to have a product at the end that can actually serve a greater number of people. I don't know if I have anything else to add. All of that was fantastic. So I will just ditto and second all of those things. Well, Michael, I hope you were taking notes because everything that all the secrets that they gave us today, you and I go and we just implemented all throughout the state of Colorado. So thank you all very much. Big thanks to our panel. Um, fantastic perspectives. Uh, the, quote of the, the quote of the day came from Michael. Uh, it was a reference to Yoda. So thank you so much, Michael, President Torrance, for, for that. Um, but in all seriousness, I think we've been given kind of this uh, this charge from Governor Polis, Dr. Piccioni, our executive director, to be bold and to think bold. And so with that artistic liberty, we're going to try and push as hard as we can on a lot of these issues. And we'd love the East Denver community to help us out in moving this into the next phase. So thank you again so much to our panelists. Um, we are, are just about out of time. If you all want to catch us on the Discord channel, please do. Um, there's a State of Colorado Discord channel, or you can find us on Twitter or a number of other medium. We will send uh, some of the resources out either in the chat or on the Discord chat. So um, thank you again to our panelists. Thank and I you. Think we are kicking it back over to Matt now. Thanks, Matt. Hey, everybody. Great job. Yeah, that was fantastic. Well, we appreciate you, Matt. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, at least... I'm, I'm happy that I got the quote of the day. <laughs> well, that's a great, uh, great job. And a lot of uh, really fantastic work that you all are doing in sort of your respective, uh, respective sort of state and government positions and, and representing in, in higher education. This is amazing. It's amazing to see, you know, government and education getting behind uh, all of this technology. So thanks for all your support.